started with this party. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank everyone who's attending this panel presentation. And the panel presentation is titled OERs for Our Changing Demographics, Hispanic American Media Education. My name is Julian Rodriguez. I am a broadcast journalism specialist in the Department of Communication at the University of Texas at Arlington. And with us in this panel is Katie Williford. She is a learning resources librarian at UT Arlington. We also have Brenda Saldana, and she is a broadcast journalism student focusing on bilingual journalism here at UT Arlington. And finally, we have uh, Nimek, we call him Danny Budvari, and he's also a broadcast journalism student focusing on bilingual journalism, focusing more on the technical side of television news production. So they're gonna be sharing some of their experiences as we go. So why don't we get started with, uh, with my presentation, my side of it, my OER, and hopefully I will be able to get this aligned really quickly. So let me share this, here we go. And so give me a thumbs up if you can see my presentation. Yes, awesome. All right, let me make this full screen. So can you see the full screen? Awesome, thank you very much. Okay, so get this out of the way. Um, so again, my name is Julian Rodriguez. You can find me on social media with the uh, Twitter and Facebook handle as at jrodmedia. And my email address is julian.rodriguez at uta.edu. If you have any question you want to reach me afterwards, uh, do through social media or send me an email. I do keep an eye on that. So the OER I've been writing for quite a while, and I say quite a while is because it was since 20. 13 that I started conceptualizing this is uh, titled Spanish language television news production in the United States. This is actually the title that you see here is in English, but the textbook, the OER is actually in Spanish. So you can see the Spanish um, uh, kind of um, cover on the left of the screen is Producción de Noticias Televisivas en Español en Estados Unidos de América. So the OER is actually in Spanish focusing on producing Spanish language television news in the United States. It's fairly complex. I started in 2013 and I gave up because I told myself, you know, I am not ripe. I'm not ready yet to write this textbook. And I had to wait five to six more years before I said, I'm ready to start writing this book. And I sat down and I wrote it like in about a month and a half. And then I learned about the OER grants. And then I received the support from uh, the UTA library. So they've been very good to me because this requires a lot of traveling and a lot of resources and a lot of time. And that's something that, that really helped me get the project off the ground. So let's talk about corn. Uh, this is American sweet corn. This is the, the corn that we all know and love here in the United States, which is the one that you find on supermarkets. And that's usually what, what, we, what we find, what we consume, the one that we know. But really, the United States, they're number, they're the number one corn that they produce is the American dent corn. And we don't know that, but that's 99% of, of the American production. And with this corn, they make you know cattle feed, all the other things that we consume. We just simply only know about the sweet corn. Uh, but there are a lot of corns in the Americas. We have tons of different kinds of corns. It's just that we basically have this sort of monoculture in the United States. Now, why in the world are we talking about corn here? Well, because there's all kinds of things in the Americans. Only in Mexico, you can find around 60 varieties of corn just in Mexico. So since we have migration from Latin American countries into the United States, then the United States really looks like this. It's not, it's not sweet corn, it's not then corn, it's really more like all kinds of things. It's a melting pot. Well, this is a very good uh, kind of analogy because it, it kind of tells you also at the same time how culture works in the United States. That is in relation to music, family, language, idioms, all kinds of things that that, that we use in the USA, 
in Spanish language only. And also you have Anglicisms that kind of sip into the Spanish language that we speak. So we're not sweet corn, we're not then corn, we're more like what you see right now, that's American society. So when we, when I started writing this OER in Spanish language about Spanish language television news production in the United States, the one thing that I had to learn is that I really need to be flexible because it doesn't necessarily fit. And if you really might wanna make it fit, then you're really gonna to have to think outside of the box and say, hey, uh, we need to make sure that we include as many things as possible and we're as flexible as possible with culture, yet we're able to identify something that is unifying here in the United States. So for those of you who are not familiar with demographics in the United States, this is the Hispanic and or Latino population uh, by state in 2012. And what you see down here, this is the state of Texas. We're located in North Texas right here. Uh, you know, the more intense the brown is, the more or the higher the percentage of Latinos living in that area. So you can actually see that we have this belt in the South where we have a lot of Latinos living. And also you can find them in Florida and you can go, you know, up to the Northeast and you'll also be able to find pockets, of course, New York City. So, so there are certain areas you can expect in this intense areas, high population, Hispanic population areas, to have a lot of Hispanic television stations. Population-wise, in 2019, we're basically reached, uh, reaching 61 million um, Hispanics uh, in the United States. Now, what is causing this increase that we see here is not necessarily people crossing the border or migrating to the United States, is children being born in the United States. So the greatest growth that we see in Latino population is mainly for children being grow, uh, born in the United States. And that brings all kinds of dynamics to, we'll get into that in a moment. But uh, you know, the largest uh, uh, counties in the United States with the largest Hispanic population, you have 11 here. I live actually in Dallas County. It's just over 1 million uh, Hispanic people or of Hispanic descent living in Dallas County. Number one being LA, LA County with almost 5 million. So it's, a, it's, it's very considerate. Uh, and, and these numbers matter because that means that uh, television and Hispanic media overall is viable because there is an audience uh, who will listen to this, who will listen to this content and, and consume the products and services that we also promote uh, in those channels. So um, it is completely viable. Now we change through time. I already said that most of the growth is happening because of children being born in the United States. So um, what, what we're looking at here is the share of Hispanic parents who speak Spanish to their children and how it declines across immigrant generations. So if you're foreign born, only 3% speaks uh, uh, you know, um, English, let's say, 97% do so. But as we progress, we see that it becomes kind of 50-50. This is the third generation. So the largest grow in the Hispanic population that we see is in the third generation Hispanic in the USA. Now, if they speak English or Spanish, that's really where bilingual journalism or the reason why bilingual journalism is growing in the United States. And the reason why we need content and OERs and educational programs focusing on the changing demographics. Not that we cannot make a viable uh, industry here, but this is something that's really starting to change every given, not only, me, not only in the media industry, every given station, it's changing everything from Ford Motor Company to Lockheed Martin to you, you name it, uh, because there is an opportunity in this uh, Hispanic uh, population growth because they grow politically, economically, socially. When we look at the breakout uh, about you know, lawful immigrants, we're talking about 35.2 million who live in the USA, and then lawful permanent residents, about 12.3 million naturalized citizens, me being one of them, uh, 20.7 million. And then we have an important group. And this important group, let me go back again because I think I advanced too fast. Uh, where this important group that you see here is about 10.5 million 
uh, there's there's a one million give and take of uh, unauthorized immigrants. Now, mainly this ones that you see here are the ones that are going to be kind of consuming uh, the news heavily in Spanish language. Now, let me clarify this. This is the foreign born population. So this also includes immigrants from different countries. I'm just simply using this to illustrate uh, that predominantly a lot of those immigrants come from Latin America, uh, especially if we're talking about unauthorized immigrants or lawful permanent residents. There is a small group, this one, temporary lawful residents. Those are your, your H-1B visas, your temporary workers and on. So there's, there's a generational change. You can actually see how this starts kind of, I don't want to say eroding because that's not the right word. It simply starts changing uh, through time. And then you have kind of a bilingual household here by the third generation. So these are the things that basically uh, motivated me to look for and create a, an OER focusing on Spanish language television news production in the United States, because this is the very first book focusing exclusively on this. There are a lot of dynamics. So I talk about TV markets and it's very complex because you have, this is the TV markets for Hispanics and this is the TV market, the markets, I call it total, meaning the entire population. In New York City, being market number one in English, if you will, it's about 7.1 million television households. But when you go to the Hispanic market, the number one is LA. Notice that they kind of flip between New York and LA being second in, in English. And in the Hispanic TV market, you have LA and then New York second. But the number one market is LA with 1.8 million television households of Hispanic descent. So there's a big difference yet. There is a large audience that you can reach with television stations because also there is less offering. So mainly you have this very two powerful uh, houses uh, that kind of have, you know, their, their paws on, on, on the Hispanic population, which is Univision and Telemundo. So these are the markets that as a level of complexity, but then when you look at that third generation, they're gonna be moving back and forth between those two. And even some of us, in my case, I'm not third generation, yet I move back and forth between English and Spanish language media consumption. So this is changing. We have an emerging bilingual journalism industry and NBC and Telemundo are owned by the same company, which is called Comcast. So because they're owned by Comcast, all the stations that are owned and operated by NBC Universal Telemundo are stations that are side by side and many of them actually are actually in the same market. So as we progress during that, we can see changes on how the multimedia and bilingual journalist works in those stations. This is actually one of our UT Arlington graduates, uh, Karen Ballesteros, she is an assignment desk or used to be an assignment desk editor for Telemundo 39 here in DFW. And she is texting and calling and looking at social media and looking what's going on online all over the place in both languages, feeding content, identifying opportunities for both the NBC side and the Telemundo side uh, of things. On top of that, we have an emerging quality, which is, or, or a new side of production, which is automation. And automation is basically the technical directing of television news productions. In this case, the gentleman that you see here, his name is Ariane Hernandez, and he is completely producing the newscast, automating the newscast directly with computers. So he's directing the show with a space bar, uh, as you can see. So, so there is a need also for automated production controls operators who are fully bilingual because many of them can work in NBC and Telemundo. So this is something that has been identified by Comcast, NBC, Universal, Telemundo. And the map that you see here is every market where NBC and Telemundo has an own and operated duopoly, meaning in each one of these dots that you see here, they own both the English language, meaning the NBC station, and they own the Spanish language, the Telemundo station, and they're all housed in this, under the same roof. Whenever we graduate a student who's fully bilingual, they can go and work in one of these markets, and they will be able to switch back and forth between NBC and Telemundo. So that gives them a strategic advantage 
over how they cover the issues affecting the local community. For instance, if we have NBC and Telemundo here in Miami and there's a hurricane that comes in, then what happens, Univision has Univision and they have their own reporters, but NBC doesn't only have the NBC reporters, they can also use the Telemundo reporters because they can also report in, uh, in English. So, so NBC can fight their competitors, ABC and Fox with and CBS with their now very flexible, easily extended uh, number of reporters because you have this bilingual reporters working in that area. So the OER is fairly complex, is an OER that contains a lot of information. So there are a lot of videos that are included. There are some examples of how you can land your first job, how to put together your demo reel. There is some data that is included. I am updating this data because we've been doing national research on salaries. So I'm going to be updating that data. Uh, there are audio interviews with uh, producers explaining how they move through their career and explain better how um, you can have social mobility when you move from position to position, from market to market. We have interviews with digital producers. This one's from Univision, now working for um, ABC8, Channel 8, WFA here in DFW. We have some examples of video editing. How do you handle translating English language sound bites into Spanish because you can't always find uh, Spanish language uh, sound bites or sources? We have recommendations from seasoned professionals and on and on. So it, this is a very complex OER. Again, I started in 2013. Finally, I sit down and write this OER. And when I finally get the grant and I'm ready to charge forward, COVID-19 shows up. And here we are meeting online through webcams and microphones, and then we're not seeing each other. So, so now that we're returning to some sort of normality, then I will be able to continue to travel and visit stations and then continue to build on this OER, hopefully to be able to release it once and for all. My estimate, it will be fall of next year. So where is this OER? Based on what I just said, really, we are right here. And that's because, because it is extremely difficult. Um, it is extremely difficult to build something based on all the corn, the type of cultures, the, the, the mix that we have to be able to come up with where the industry is, where it's going, how do we use language, uh, how language and culture and demographic uh, affect or change the way the industry functions and on and on. So it's not an easy endeavor. We're working on that. There's a reason why this is the very first one. And the reason in many ways why this is becoming my live project is because it is, it is truly testing. So, so I'm glad that I'm able to get the support from UTA libraries. I'm glad that I'm able to work with Latino uh, students who actually are interested in bilingual journalism because they're going to help us in many ways, not only create the OER, but test the OER, and they're also becoming my sources of information to be able to enrich the OER as we grow. We invited to this conversation two of our students, Brenda Saldana and Dani, and I guess we, we can start with Brenda. Brenda has been producing some news reports. Uh, we worked with the Telemundo News Service. We're the only, um, the only university who actually posts and shares and publishes content on the Telemundo News Service at the national level. So effectively, my students share every Hispanic TV household in the nation. And we've been doing that for several years and it's just fantastic because that helps us serve also certain areas uh, that lack news content. In other words, what is known as news deserts. So my students are actually now creating content that is seen at the national level. And thanks to this and thanks to their work, once they graduate, uh, their job placement rate is 100%. And since we started this project in 2010, our graduation rate has been 100%. Every student that joins the Hispanic Media Initiative at UT Arlington graduates, period. So it's fascinating. So here's Brenda, let me stop sharing my screen so that you can take over from here. 
Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, you let me. So hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brenda Saldana. I am a broadcasting student at UT Arlington, like Julian just said. I did produce content for Telemundo News Service this uh, spring. It was quite a journey for me. It was actually my first package that I did in Spanish and for the Hispanic media. Uh, so it was kind of nerve wracking for me. I didn't really know where to start at first because all, like I said, everything that I did was in English typically. So it was kind of like a journey. And these resources are very helpful for me because like I said, they inform me a lot about the Hispanic audience. And this book specifically that Julian is making, when I was reading it, I learned a lot about the demographics that I didn't really quite know before and the economic classes and everything that there is like first generation immigrants, second immigration immigrants. And it's very important to know as a reporter because you get to know your audience more and once you know your audience, then you know kind of like the topic that you're gonna talk about because it it's for your audience and it's just very important. So it creates the focus and engagement. Uh, once I've used these resources, I get to know how I'm gonna engage with my audience and it's very helpful. Once I'm making my reports, I wanna know how I'm gonna engage with them and how I'm gonna create that focus. And it also informs me all about my different opportunities that I have as a broadcast student. At first, whenever I went into UTA, I just wanted to be a reporter or I just wanted to be an anchor because that's all I see in the TV. I just see the reporter and I just see the anchor. I never see the people that are behind the screens until I actually started learning. Uh, once I use different resources and once I actually went to class, I saw that there are many different people behind the scenes. We have technical directors, we have producers, we have news directors. And when I was reading Julian's OER, actually, it was very helpful because I got to see a very detailed explanation of each position. And it kind of helped me learn a little bit more of myself as well, of what I want to do. Uh, maybe I don't just want to be a reporter. Maybe I want to be something more than that. So it's very helpful. And also, uh, let me share, sorry. Sorry, I'm trying to, okay, yeah, I slide. Uh, so I also learned, I viewed many different stories from different reporters and I kind of got to see their process of what, how they were thinking uh, whenever they were making these stories. I actually took these from Julian's uh, OER that he made. I found these very helpful. There was a story by a reporter um, called Angel. He made a story about a guy who was cleaning windows uh, he saw him one day at his job and he, he's an immigrant who was cleaning windows and I found this story very interesting because uh, like the process behind it so it was very important because it details the American dream. Uh, this guy was an immigrant who came into the U.S. and he's working hard for his family and it kind of uh, really helped me I was very helpful seeing the process behind this story and how it was made. And this right here is basically a very important graph that I took. Uh, so it's the new story and what makes a new story a good successful new story would be if it's about something important, relevant and interesting. And I found that very helpful. And I think students need this kind of guide when they're making their own reports or they're doing their own work. They, it's always helpful to look at other professionals and how they create their own work and the mindset that goes behind everything that they do. So this was very helpful to me as I learned it. Like I said, his topic was about the guy that was cleaning the windows. Uh, he was an immigrant and it was a very heartfelt story for the Hispanic audience and how it shows the determination and the hard work when he was making the story. And I kind of related it with my own package that I've made for Telemundo. Uh, my package was about financial literacy and the importance of it for the Hispanic community. I wanted to raise awareness of the different resources that Hispanics have. Uh, most Hispanics often don't really think there's many resources available to them in the US uh, simply because they don't speak English, but I wanted to show that there is a lot of that. And by these o OERs that I really have, I really find really helpful while I'm using these resources that I am given to make these stories and make them come to life uh, as I talk to different people and I get to engage more with my community. So it's always very important for me to just take everything in and you know, there's never enough that you can learn. There's always stuff out there that you can learn and these resources really help me learn and just have helps me tell a very interesting, important and relevant story. So. Yes, thank you for this. Let me see if I can stop. Thank you, Brenda.
Now we're going to move into uh, Danny's turf. And Danny mainly focuses on the technical directing side of things and he has interesting stuff to share. Um, you just got a fellowship with the Texas Rangers here, Pusen, right? Yes, sir. I'm actually at the Texas Rangers Stadium right now. So you can see over there. That's the <laughs> turf right there. Um, for some reason, it blanked out on me that this the that um, the panel was going to be at one, and I was just realizing that I'm still at work at one. So I took off for a little bit, and I'm here. Uh, I'm. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is really a great opportunity, and I just want to share my screen here a little presentation that I did about uh, the technical production point of view in, uh, in news broadcast. Um, like Brenda, Brenda said, whenever you come into the news world, you, you know the anchors, you know the reporters, but you never get, really get to know the people behind the scenes. And uh, when she said that she finally learned about the people behind the scenes, well, that's me. I'm, I'm the people behind the scenes. Uh, I'm the one in behind the, who is behind the scenes pushing the button. So uh, this is my production. Oh, and my name is Nimo Urvari. If you're wondering um, how exactly I fit into the whole Hispanic thing, um, my dad is from India. So my name is not Hispanic, but I, uh, but I am Hispanic. I live most of my life in Mexico. Uh, so don't don't let the name fool you like Julian uh, when we first met. <laughs> but um, But yeah. Uh, this is my Twitter handle or my Instagram handle if you want to follow me. Uh, that's how you get in contact. But essentially the technical production side. So we start with the technical director. That is my position. That is the position that I'm training for actually. Um, the, the technical director position used to actually be split between the director and the technical director. Uh, but more recently it has been integrated all uh, as in the technical director. The technical director uh, was and is the person controlling the switcher, which is the, the, what you see right now. This is actually the switcher that we have here at the Texas Rangers. Uh, I had the good fortune to um, to get to run one of the pregames uh, with the switcher. It was pretty intimidating, as you can see, the switcher. But, um, but it was great. It was great, uh, a great opportunity. Uh, the technical director is the person that operates the switcher, and the director is the person that was, it was used to be the person that, uh, that indicates uh, the technical director how to do his job. Um, thanks to technological advancements, you know, the latest, the latest technology uh, allows us to automate almost all technical sides of, of production. As Julian showed you in one of the, in one of the videos, uh, the technical directors of today, they don't really use the, the switcher anymore. They have integrated into the most popular system. Well, the most popular system uh, is called ROS Overdrive uh, Automated Production uh, Control, uh, or we just call it APC. Um, this is what usually technical directors use to automate um, most production most production aspects in uh, in the newscast. Uh, both cameras and audio, among other things, are integrated into the technical director production with this program. Um, the traditional uh, technical director. I just have a, a simple video here. It's the traditional technical uh, technical director uh, position, essentially doing. Um, his job, if we can speak, skip for a little bit. Um, so the traditional technical director used the switcher in order to, to broadcast the, the, the newscast. And then as Julian showed you in the APC, the new technical director or um, the APC uh, operator doesn't use the switcher anymore. He uses, um, he uses a, a keyboard. He uses essentially the space bar to, to, to mm, to move what, it, what is already the manufactured um, program. The APC, what it allows you to do is to be less uh, involved and less on hands whenever the, the program is go, goes live. It's more, more about coding and, and building the newscast before the, 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 the newscast actually airs and then just seeing it through and being kind of like a, a crisis handler in case anything goes wrong in the, in, during the newscast. Um, if I can, there we go. So the APC has now automated um, most of the of the newsroom uh, or the behind the scenes in the newsroom. So uh, with the APC, you can control the audio, you can control the cameras whenever they're um, they're automated. You can control the graphics and you control the videos, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The APC kind of works as a, as a mediator. William usually uses the the the, the simile of of uh, an, an octopus that controls everything uh, and, and integrates it to the APC uh, in, the news, in the newsroom. And then 
I just want to give you uh, a little bit of my student perspective. Um, before coming into the to the broadcast uh, world, I was a communications major. I didn't know what communications meant. I didn't know what a communi communications major did. But uh, fortunately, I had the great uh, opportunity of meeting Julian. Uh, we had a little bit of back and forth of me trying to join the program of UT News in Espanol and, and Hispanic Media Initiative, mainly because he didn't believe that I was Hispanic uh, until we actually met and I started speaking Spanish to him. Uh, which is my first language. Uh, the, the, the perspective is, 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 is essentially what Brenda said, that, uh, that we get to help back our community. We get to inform our community. And, and the fact that we get to do this is, is such a fulfilling aspect of the job, uh, where even if I'm behind the scenes, I know that I'm still trans transmitting information back to our community. And it is such an important, important job um, we are really thankful for what Julian has done, has built over the over these last ten years, where all of our students have now are now going into the news world, and then providing news for our uh, our communities and the Hispanic community. So this is essentially a little bit of my perspective, perspective on what I do and what I'm learning with with Julian. Such an amazing program; it has changed my life completely, and I am really thankful for it. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. I really appreciate it. Really nice picks. <laughs> so um, now with us is uh, Katie, and Katie is going to discuss um, everything that has to do with how the UTA libraries support the creation of OERs, and you know mainly this one, which is which is kind of weird because it's in Spanish. But I just learned that there's there's a there's also a recently published Spanish language OER. So that's wonderful. Uh, so here's here's Carrie, Katie. Hi, yes, absolutely. So um, like Julian said, I'm just gonna kind of give um, the, the library support uh, side of things. Um, so our OER department lives within uh, UTA libraries. We have uh, quite a few uh, full-time staff and um, graduate students who assist our OER creators and collaborators. So the first piece is kind of the awareness piece, um, just getting the information out to the, our UTA community um, instructors and professors about what it is we can offer and what it is we can do um, for those interested and publishing their scholarship with us. So a lot of universities have a grant program um, centered around affordability um, or OER creation. Um, this is ours. It's called uh, the UTA CARES grant program. Um, we have a variety of award categories ranging from an adoption stipend to uh, the innovation grants, um, which is the um, grants that Julian uh, received. And um, the innovation grants are gonna be more for those projects that are a little more time intensive. Um, maybe there isn't anything that currently exists out there. So a lot of the content will have to be created by the author um, or they're having to kind of piecemeal from a variety of open sources. Um, we do get a lot of interest um, in our grant program and kind of try to help instructors, um, you know, apply for the category that best meets their needs for their project they have in mind. Um, we try to encourage a lot of our instructors to think about open pedagogy opportunities. Um, that's certainly something that we love to see is uh, students being able to engage with the content and the resource in a bit of a different way um, and being, you know, participants um, for that content creation process rather than just passively. Um, absorbing that content. Um, we do get a lot of interest um, through our hosting of open textbook workshops. It's a nice transition when we're encouraging folks to write a review of an open textbook um, and they're able to see if that meets the needs for their course. And again, um, you know, we share information about the grant program during the workshop. Um, we also try to attend um, and disseminate information through the new faculty orientations um, so that our faculty at UTA are getting that messaging from, you know, the very get-go about the potential for OER creation. I think that's one of the things um, that folks are often surprised by um, as more, I think, universities are starting to venture into the OER publishing side rather than just the OER adoption. Um, but we get a lot of interest there where it's not just, you know, the OER adoption, but you have the possibility to create your own OER and publish um, with us. 
So over the past, well, I guess over a year now, a lot of our community meetings and workshops have been through Microsoft Teams is the platform that we use here at UTA. Um, we have a um, OER team in Teams, and it kind of serves as a good community hub um, for you know advertising upcoming webinars um, and folks can um, join in and ask questions through that platform. Um, we do offer a, a variety of workshops for those interested in publishing OER with us. Um, we know that it can seem very daunting to do this type of work. As Julian mentioned, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, and so on the library side from our perspective, we just want to make sure we provide all of the tools um, necessary so that our um, authors feel confident um, in the publication process. So we offer workshops um, such as information about Pressbooks, which is the platform that we use for publishing. So how to import content um, and to customize things. We offer workshops on uh, copyright and accessibility, really anything and everything to do with the OER publication process. Um, we often host uh, panels so that uh, folks like Julian who've had um, a lot of experience and have already started down this road and maybe have even published their own OER can share information to their fellow uh, professors and instructors here at UTA. I think it's one thing to hear things from a librarian, um, but I think it's another um, to really hear, um, you know, good advice from instructors who've already been down this OER publication road. This is a, a screen grab of our MAVS Open Press catalog page. Um, it just talks again a little bit about what we offer to the UTA community that um, are hoping to publish um, their work. Um, we do work with a vendor um, for those instructors who would like optional print copies uh, for students. Um, I think it's a way that we demonstrate that we need to be respectful of a variety of learning preferences. Um, so we want to offer you know, a variety of formats um, for students to engage with that resource in the way that best meets their needs. Um, I wanted to highlight uh, this uh, OER that we have recently published. We're very excited about it. It's called A Guide to OER Creation with Mavs Open Press. Um, and this really actually serves as almost a one-stop shop for a lot of the, the process that our OER creators are going to go through. So it outlines our policies, our procedures, um, it talks about the two accessibility checks that all of our OER go through um, during the process. It goes into things like copyright, fair use, seeking permission for third party content. And it also has a piece on um, student communication. So there is a little blurb um, in one of the sections um, that instructors can post into their syllabus that just basically highlights that this course is using an OER um, and what that entails and kind of what that means. I think it's very important that we involve students um, with this conversation and um, make them fully aware about OER and how that impacts you know, their student success and their experience um, while they're, they're with, with us at UTA. Um, there's also a section on our student surveys. So for all of the UTA CARES grantees, um, we um, offer student surveys um, through the instructor. So um, it's completely optional for students um, and entirely anonymous, um, but it's a good chance for the students to provide their feedback and their perspective. Um, so it asks questions um, like, you know, what was your overall perception of this OER as compared to a, a commercial traditional textbook? Um, and so we're getting that feedback. And then um, one of the things that I think is the most um, surprising to me um, is the number of students that have responded um, about the ease of access piece um, that they enjoy being able to access their course materials from a variety of formats they're accessing from their phone from you know a laptop um, and they really highlight how that's you know impacted their success in that course um, we have a variety of students some are you know taking online courses and they're not here in, you know within the community and some are on campus and they are taking some online courses so we never really want to assume you know what their preferred I guess, modality or a way that they interact with the resource is gonna be. Um, so that's a, a good opportunity. Um, this guide has been 
essential for, you know, directing folks who may be interested or kind of want to see what the process is going to look like. I mean, it goes into detail about the book structure and, you know, um, where we put the accessibility statement, where we put image credits. And with our um, OER team in Microsoft Teams, they call it team. Um, it's kind of redundant, but, um, you know, a lot of folks at other institutions are not always able to see some of that information um, or some of our workshops that have been reported. So this guide is a really great way um, for us to be able to share out information because we do have faculty that, you know, they start a project and they go to another institution or something like that. And we wanna make sure that um, we're being open about our processes and our procedures because I think it's helpful for others maybe looking to start um, venturing into the field of kind of OER publication and that sort of thing. Um, so this was the resource that uh, Julian mentioned. Um, this was actually funded, um, I believe, in spring of 2018. Um, it's our um, other Spanish language uh, resource OER that we have um, funded and we're very excited about. It was recently published. Um, it's a textbook for advanced Spanish composition students. And um, the project author is actually noted in the overview, which is included in the resource, um, that the project specifically aligns with the mission of Hispanic serving institutions to promote and advance you know, retention rates and graduation rates for first generation college students. Um, we know at UTA, we have one of the most diverse student body populations in the country. Um, and I think, you know, to Julian's point um, and to Brenda and Danny's, it's about, you know, the community and um, seeing maybe those gaps in the literature and making sure that we're correcting those. And I think that Julian's project and, and this one as well really serves as a great counterpoint uh, to those uh, comments that I often hear and receive um, from some folks about, well, you know, I would love to adopt OER, but there's really just nothing out there um, in this field. Um, and to that, I, I get to say, you know, we do have professors and instructors here at UTA and other institutions that see that and acknowledge that, and they're passionate about this work, and they're passionate about their work and how OER can impact student success. And they're working towards, you know, addressing that. Um, and, you know, it may not be today or tomorrow. And we know that these things take time. Life happens and our instructors have, um, you know, hectic workloads. But um, we on the library side want to do everything possible to ensure that the process is as easy as possible. And that again, our, our content creators have the tools that they need um, to do this type of work um, and to impact student success here at UTA, other institutions and our community members as well. Um, so with that, um, Julian, if you have anything you wanted to add, we can maybe go into q and I know we don't have a ton of time left. You've said it all, Katie. No, really, um, well, I think it's fantastic that we have so many people in this in this panel, and I really would like to invite, you know, you to ask us questions. Any questions that you might have uh, that you would like clarified? Any questions that you might have about the, the process or um, why choose an OER instead of actually publishing the book? Um, I guess I just I just asked that question, so I'm going to go for it. Uh, while we wait for questions to either be written on the chat or someone to open the mic. But I initially, when I started looking at this, I, I work with some of my mentors uh, through the years. And, and they said it's going to be very difficult for you to publish this book because there's really, I actually was about to sign a contract with Routledge in New York. They assigned me an editor and said, okay, let's get this started. When I was about to sign this, I look at the entire contract that and at no point in time, I guess, they assumed or I even say it out loud that the textbook was going to be in Spanish. So I was about to sign, I called New York and I said, uh, you guys know that this textbook is in Spanish, right? You, you need to assign me an editor who speaks Spanish. And, and they said, oh my God, no, we don't, we don't do that. Uh, we don't have the resources. Uh, we, we just don't do that. I said, we can't do it then. Uh, so it, it completely went away. I started looking for editors uh, in New York and Spain. And although I could find them, 
the distribution here in the United States would have been very slow and expensive and on. So I said, okay, the next step when I was talking to my mentor was publish it yourself through Amazon. And, you know, just they will print as, as, as its order. And I said, okay, let me try that. I need to surround myself with editors. I need to surround myself just like following any process that normally when you're writing a textbook, you, you would follow. And, and I did that, but I didn't like the idea of if it's going to be adopted, because some professors in Latin America wanted to adopt the textbook to some extent. And I said, well, how do you make the textbook available in Latin America with Amazon and all of that? And that's when I said, you know, let me take a look at this OER. And that's when I learned about this opportunity. And I said, this is perfect because I, I wanted the other bad thing about publishers is that they charge too much money for, for this book, uh, for any book, really. So I wanted to lower that. Then I got to Amazon. I said, what's the lowest possible that I could charge so that they can pay for printing and delivering? And it was going to end up being like between 20 and 30, something like that. But then I needed to have videos and illustrations and things that you can't have on a, on a physical book. And then the OER became the best platform to say, you can get it for free, you can access it, you can watch all the videos and it can be make it more interactive. You can listen to interviews, like podcasts, and it was just absolutely perfect. And the fact that it's absolutely free, even better. Um, no one gets rich selling textbooks. And I was not looking for that at all at any point, at any moment in time. I was just looking for the perfect platform, the perfect opportunity. And then the UTA libraries presented that quite, um, quite handsomely. So, so I'm very happy for that. Um, there's a comment here on the chat. Very excited to hear about this project. Hope there are some collaboration opportunities with the CC Echo project in California. Focus on OER and HSI institutions. Absolutely, I can absolutely look at that website. And and again, this is this is not going to be just a a one edition. This is this is literally going to be a life project. I know that I'm going to be like 72 and a half, and I'm still writing chapter 10, just because just because the demographics are going to change, technology is going to change, language is going to change, politics change, everything changes. So have to constantly update that. And that's a lot easier when you do it online with OER uh, because, well, you can just go online, go to WordPress, log in, and then rock and roll, and you update this. Make sure that everything is written properly with your editor. Make sure that you inform UTA libraries, and then they push that PDF that can be printed. So it's just a fantastic platform to be able to, to share content for free, uh, regardless of where you are on planet Earth. So. So yeah, it, it's wonderful. Allison is back. <laughs> uh, we have about less than two minutes. I'm a broadcaster. So she said 150 and 150, it is going to be. So if you have any questions, you have about a minute and 30 seconds to pursue that. Allison, anything else to add or anyone here would like to add to this conversation? Anything at all? Everyone is quiet. Well, yes, I just wanted to say um, how thankful, I know that Brenda feels the same way, how thankful we are as, as students for all the opportunities that you have given us, uh, not only Julian, but UTA libraries and, and whoever's watching this, um, if you are inspired of, or, or, or anything to do something, something like this back in your community or, or, or anything, you're not only changing our lives as students, you're changing, you're shaping communities as wholes. So thank you so much. Yes, I just want to add to that too. And I want to say thank you so much to Julian, to UTA Libraries, and to everyone. Uh, this has actually uh, been very helpful. Julian has been so helpful to me and he's really changed my perspective and the broadcasting. And he's just such a great teacher. And I'm so thankful for everyone. <laughs> ah, she's not going to get an A. That, that's not going to get you an A, Brenda. That's only going to give you more responsibility. <laughs> uh, okay. So it's 1.49. Um, uh, thank you very much for those who were in attendance. We really appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule and devoting uh, this to our conversation on this OER. And I'm going to send it back to Allison because she is she's the captain of the boat here. Thank you all so much for sharing. I, I know I'm inspired and um, for, for all of your efforts and, and everything that you've, you've put into this. And 
excited to see it come through and and to see students participating and so engaged in something is just like it's, it's just great so um thank you all for for your time and, and uh efforts in presenting and um we'll see you at the next session have a good day bye thank you